Welcome back, uh, we are continuing our discussion on photolithography. So, let us see how far we have now understood. So, now you see you understand all these stages and in the previous class, in fact, we had a pretty detailed discussion about this particular step. And uh, now you also understand that though in this schematic or the cartoon movie we showed, you tend to believe that the mask is always placed in conformal contact with the photoresist layer, that is not exactly the case. So, you can have an additional reducer uh, reduction lens between these two, they may not be in contact, you can have proximal proximity printing mode etcetera, etcetera. But anyway, the basic function after the UV exposure is this and that is where the photoresist undergoes change in its property. So, now you are all set after your photoresist had been exposed to develop it and to transfer the mask pattern onto the photoresist layer to start with. So, let us see what we need to do. Uh, we first the thing we need to do is we need to do wafer cooling before development because you if you remember I mentioned that uh, right after uh, exposure you do a post uh, exposure bake uh, at about temperatures 90 or 110 to 130 degree centigrade. So, the uh, uh, wafer is uh, still hot and uh, you need to cool it down because high temperature uh, uh, if you expose uh, if you develop at high temperature it might in fact uh, lead to loss of photoresist from uh, areas where you do not want to uh, get it removed. So, uh, this is the development process which is in fact very simple and if you look into this schematic for a second you will understand it yourself. So, this the top layer shows the location of the mask I mean these are the areas where uh, the mask was opaque. So, no light passed this is the slit through which the light passed and you had an uniform photoresist layer. So, now you yourself understand that the areas where so this has led to a negative replica. So, what it means that the areas where uh, the light has shined on the photoresist layer those areas have strengthened right and in contrast this is a positive photoresist layer. So, the areas over which the light has shined it has in fact weakened. So, we now know that the developer in fact removes the relatively weak zone and that is precisely what is done. Very important to uh, understand is that you are let us say I am just drawing this picture again. So, this is a positive photoresist and this part is the so called weaker part, but please do not. So, your developer is a solvent for this particular uh, polymer or photoresist. Please do not forget that after all it is the same material only some part may be the chains are smaller here as compared to this area or something like that. So, if you keep it immersed in the developer solution for very long time everything is going to go away. So, your time for development is extremely important because if you keep it for longer duration it might uh, everything might get dissolved. If you keep it for shorter duration even the layer that you wanted to dislodge might not get removed fully. So, you can easily end up getting something like this. So, this is sort of underdeveloped and uh, so this sort of gives you a very comprehensive idea. So, uh, this is the ideal development profile right. So, what is this? This is the strengthened part or the stronger part of the resist and you typically would like to have a vertical profile. So, uh, dosage is the exposure in fact and this is the developer. So, in this particular geometry please remember that without going into too much detail that this is what you aspire to have. So, the same problem will happen uh, if your exposure uh, timing is also not appropriate if you under expose then across the whole layer uh, where below the mask 
the uh, material will not change property. So, let us say it will change property up to this point. Similarly, if you overexpose, then in fact the material tends to change property uh, uh, along uh, or even the neighboring areas sort of tend to uh, get uh, affected by the uh, presence of the UV radiation, because it is not a question of direct shining of the light, it is in fact a question. So, light comes from here, it brings in certain amount of energy and that energy in fact causes the structural changes in this zone. So, if you have excess amount of energy, what will happen? The it is a simple heat transfer problem, the energy will start percolating in this direction and the zone over which the structural change in the photoresist layer takes place will increase. Uh, similarly, so this is overexposed, this is a problem of overexposure and uh, in the process what you do? You actually get wider structures on the photoresist layer as compared to your mask and that is something you do not want to have, because uh, at least for the microelectronic industry you need to achieve as small structures as possible. So, this spoils your performance. Uh, on the other hand, so this is a problem that, that can happen during over exposure as well as now that we understand that after exposure it has to be developed. So, this problem can again happen if you over develop. So, it is very, very important that the timing not only for development for exposure as well as development is suitably optimized, that is extremely important. Uh, exactly similar will be the case uh, where if your development is, if your sorry, if your exposure is inadequate, again the same problem happens, you actually have less amount of energy coming in through the UV radiation that is necessary to make structural changes to this amount of uh, photoresist. And what will happen is, if you, uh, if you under expose, of course, the layers close to the top, the photoresist close to the top layer, they receive adequate amount of energy but due to uh, 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 the resistance against heat transfer, uh, these layers towards the bottom part, they get lesser amount of energy and they do not undergo appropriate changes in structure. And so, when you try to develop an underexposed photoresist layer, you are very likely to get uh, structures like this. So, what is that? Uh, the, the exposed part of the photoresist did not dislodge fully. So, it is some sort of a remnant layer that remains and you know very well this is going not going to uh, help your cause. Be why? Because finally, patterning the photoresist is not your objective. You actually want to transfer the patterns on the photoresist layer uh, uh, to the uh, barrier layer below and this if the remnant photoresist layer is present, the barrier layer is not exposed. So, your whole functionality is lost. Therefore, it is extremely important to suitably optimize the uh, both the exposure and the development stages. This uh, cartoon also sort of uh, gives you a quick idea about that. So, this is appropriate, it uh, is medium written as medium and moderate, but this is the optimum cases. So, this is optimum, optimally developed and uh, optimally exposed. So, this seems to have uh, high exposure uh, may be associated with low development. There are cases where this overcut structures are required. There is a methodology that we will discuss in lift off, where this type of structures are desirable. You may for some other application, not exactly for your microelectronics, but you may want to have this type of trapezoidal structure. So, now you know what to do. You sort of uh, do a bit of low uh, uh, exposure and you can uh, do some bit of uh, uh, stronger development and you get what is known as the undercut structure. But uh, I mean these are details and you may want to tailor the geometry and the sharpness of the line with all this can be doable. The take home message is this can all be done, but uh, ideally from the plain vanilla photolithography standpoint, this is what you would like to have. Uh, we, I mean just a minute I will spend on the development methodology. So, typically it gives us a feeling that if you want to develop you take a beaker 
which contains the developer solution. You take the exposed uh, photoresist uh, coated uh, wafer and simply rinse it there and you achieve the development, which indeed is doable. It is, it is absolutely doable in a lab scale, but industrially uh, where, where with a high throughput system, it is difficult to do. So, uh, how do you do it? And industry has very cleverly utilized again the spin coating platform for development. So, what you simply do is just the way you um, uh, obtained your photoresist layer, you simply put the uh, exposed substrate, exposed wafer again back to the spin coating platform. You now instead of dispensing a solution, simply dispense the development developer solution and rinse it for a finite duration. So, it is all optimized and as you rinse it, the two advantages take place. In fact, it rinses, it washes away and simultaneously the since there is lot of splashing in spin coating. So, this washed uh, photoresist or the dissolved photoresist, please understand that this is this can also be a nuisance because this may want to redeposit on your other intact parts and that again uh, uh, sort of spoils your functionality. So, development on a spin coating platform eliminates redeposition completely. So, this is sort of um, industrially accepted now and it is pretty routinely done. Uh, so, once it is developed, do not forget that uh, during development, so this is what you had started off with and then you develop and then you get to this and now you know what you have is the burial layer, which is fine, but uh, either you use the spin coating platform or you use the uh, simple rinsing technique. One thing is obvious that the whole photoresist layer has again come in contact with the solvent, uh, which is the developer solution itself. And please do not forget that this solvent or the developer solution is indeed a good solvent for this photoresist material. Maybe this part of the material is not dislodged because it has higher strength, higher molecular weight, higher viscosity, higher resistance towards dissolution, higher res resistance against dissolution and therefore, it stays there. But what is unavoidable from, uh, from a fundamental standpoint is there will be some uptake of the solvent by this uh, photoresist or the so called stronger part of the photoresist matrix. Uh, so, so, the, so, the essentially this photoresist layer, this remaining photoresist layer after development is in fact wet and this is not wet with moisture, but it is wet with the solvent and this solvent is nothing but the developer itself. So, again uh, next stage is you, you would like to, what is the next stage you, you all know. Once you have the pattern photoresist layer, you are now going to do the etching, so that you can transfer the patterns on the photoresist to the burial layer. And the presence of the solvent in within the photoresist is going to definitely interfere with the etching step, the chemicals that you are going to use for etching, it is going to uh, create some problem. So, it is important now to eliminate the solvent again and so how do you do that? You do that by hard baking. So, this is uh, very interesting, I mean you have different baking stages in photolithography. So, rolls are roughly the same, soft baking removes the solvent after spin coating, initial spin coating, so that uh, the solvent is not exposed during the, the solvent is not present due the, during the UV exposure. Exactly same way after you have developed, again the photoresist contains some solvent and that solvent needs to be removed and so, so it is done, it is done by the process called hard baking. Uh, there is an intermediate baking stage and that is the post exposure baking. So, this is something important that you have to bake it at different levels to eliminate all possible contaminants that might be present in a, in a, in a polymeric matrix. And see, when I talk about this uh, solvent uptake by a polymer, by, by this photoresist, in fact, we are talking about uh, some physics which we discussed when, while we were discussing about uh, surface tension. We did not go into the detail and that is the steric interaction. See, the photoresist after all is a cross-link polymer chain. So, you have a network like structure and between these networks, there are a lot of space for the solvent to actually go and remain entrapped, which you will not even realize that it is stuck up there and dislodging this type of 
entrap solvent is pretty difficult and therefore, the only way you can do that is to do some baking where you increase the temperature. So, that the rate of evaporation increases. What is in fact rate of evaporation? In fact, the kinetic energy of the molecules increase. So, they pre prefer to change phase and go to the vapor phase and therefore, they uh, leave, they overcome the capillary adhesion and sort of leave the polymer matrix. So, these are very, very interrelated connected things and if you look at, uh, at the fundamental level, uh, everything has a reason, nothing is done for without a reason and I hope if you are enjoying this course, following this course, you should be able to connect it uh, within uh, by your own understanding by now. So, typical temperature again do not uh, try to remember this temperatures, nobody is going to ask you what is the temperature in uh, hard bake or this and that. Uh, so, evaporating all the solvent of photoresistor. So, this is important. What the hard baking does, it, it removes all the solvent and then the second stage to understand or second step to remember is what we discussed, where does the solvent come? The solvent comes from the development stage itself and uh, of course, it uh, improves the H uh, resistance. Uh, these are terms. So, if one says, well, it improves the H resistance, you will learn, okay, it does uh, enhance the H resistance, but what it is? It is that you are going to do some processing for the etching. The simplest form is a hydro, hydrofluoric acid wash, which is known as the wet etching and you do not want some organic solvent to be present and contaminate this acid, because then the functionality of the acid and what is the functionality of the acid? The functionality of the acid is to etch off the barrier layer will be reduced. So, you want to stay clear of that and do the hard baking step. Uh, then uh, there are additional steps, but we will uh, not talk about all those things. Then comes the etching step and uh, again, so if we quickly have a look at uh, this particular uh, figure, what are we doing? In fact, we are doing something that is missing in this schematic that you want to transfer because if you compare figures 7 and figure 8, right? These in fact represent to two steps, if you look very carefully. See here you have a patterned photoresist layer and here you see that you have a patterned barrier layer. So, in fact, two processing steps have taken place. One is etching of the barrier layer, that is something I have missed out while I was preparing the schematic, sorry for that. I should have probably drawn, but I, then I do not know how exactly to show it. Maybe the video will uh, give you a slightly better idea. So, let us uh, look into that. Uh, so, these steps you know, yeah, so it is a good revision and when I take this course in my class in uh, IIT Kharagpur, uh, I always show it. So, see once you place the photo mask and then uh, you do the exposure. So, this is where after you remove your uh, mask, you would like to do the PEB. So, this is where you do your PEB and then uh, you do the development, right. So, after you do the development, your weakened part of the photoresist layer goes away, but at the cost of there are some solvent uptake by the uh, uh, hardened part of the photoresist layer and therefore, what you do is you do a hard bake. And once it is hard baked, now it is ready for uh, etching. So, this is the step which, you, which, which will correspond to etching. So, you see first what you do is you do the etching, so that the pattern along the contours of the photoresist layer is transferred into the barrier layer, that is one stage. And once the barrier layer has been etched, you next need to remove the so called hardened part of the photoresist, right. So, this is the steps. And if you noticed carefully, these two steps have been sort of combined uh, between these two. So, first you do an etching, uh, sorry, first you, yeah, first you do an etching and then you do a photoresist removal to achieve this structure and then you place this for doping. So, the doping takes place only over this zone and then what is here is that you remove uh, the oxide layer or the barrier layer itself. Okay. So, uh, we will talk about etching shortly, briefly. So, this is uh, sort of etching and uh, the schematic itself uh, tells you everything. So, let us say this is your uh, pattern photoresist layer, 
this is the layer that you would like to etch and as we talked and uh, this is the desired profile. But there are issues, so I will not go into too much amount of details because this is a bit heavy and uh, we have many things to consider, but etching can be what you for the context of this course, what we can claim that etching can be of uh, primarily two types. Uh, one is an wet etching which is like using hydrogen fluoride. Uh, logic is that hydrogen fluoride will dissolve, dissolves the oxide layer, but reality is that uh, so HF the wet etching. often hydrogen fluoride is used, uh, is selective. So, you would like your etchant to only remove what, what is desirable. So, if this is the geometry of your uh, pattern photoresist layer, you would actually like your etchant to remove only this much amount of material. What you do not like is you do not like your agent to eat up material from here and you also do not like your agent to eat up material from here and that is exactly what is shown here. Uh, that is or, or maybe here, in fact that is the problem if you apply wet etching, it indeed dissolves the barrier layer or the oxide over here, but then it is sort of uh, it starts to diffuse in this direction also, because you cannot stop that it is a seamless monolith material and as a consequence it often results in a shape like this. Uh, it typically does not attack silicon, so that is not a problem, but there can be other layers where etching can eat up from the bottom layer and this is something you do, do, do not want to have. So, this is an example of a non-selective and isotropic etching. This is isotropic because it is eating up here, here, but it is selective. It does not uh, affect the substrate material, it is even better but what you would like to achieve is an isotropic and selective etching. And I am sorry to say with wet etching which is very simple you can do in your lab with, but be very careful HF is a deadly material. So, please be very careful if any one of you is using HF or Pirhana solution and things like that. They appear to be very simple uh, liquids, but be very careful with them otherwise you can really land up in disaster. So, uh, I know I mean for research many people try out this and that, but be very careful with hydrogen fluoride. Uh, so, most cases the, though this is the easiest etching uh, you can really think of, but uh, uh, it, it does not the wet etching does not have uh, uh, does not provide proper uh, selectivity or anisotropy. So, uh, there are different uh, methodologies uh, for uh, achieving this type of etching and uh, one of them is to go for this reactive ion etching, where you in fact utilize a plasma uh, to sort of create some ions and the ions sort of uh, attack the layer, the barrier layer in one particular direction and you can it can lead to some sort of uh, anisotropic and selective, because this photoresist layer existing photoresist layer sort of acts as a uh, barrier and prevents since it is anisotropic. So, the ions only charge in this particular direction and as a result uh, uh, you get uh, very sharp uh, uh, edges of the boundary. So, uh, the this requires additional instrumentation typically reactive ion etching and stuff like dry reactive ion etching etcetera are already there and uh, so uh, 
those things might be necessary. Uh, just take a minute to. So, uh, see we have sort of reached uh, almost all the points. We are now in a position where uh, you have achieved this. Uh, 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 so, you have a pattern barrier layer and how you have done this. So, the next step of course, is that you initially had somewhere this structure also. So, I will just quickly redraw. So, this is the wafer and the discussion up to which we have reached, we have created uh, this structure. That is now you have patterns in the barrier layer as well as in the photoresist layer. So, uh, before I end here is a quick uh, schematic of reactive ion etching. Uh, which uh, you create, uh, um, it is different from weight etching and use chemically reactive plasma to remove material deposited on the wafer. So, uh, you require two electrodes in fact and then you use a plasma where your photoresist layer, the pattern photoresist layer in fact acts as a guide and you expect it to eat up material from here. Uh, you typically need a vacuum. Uh, you can check out with uh, terms like RIE and DRIE. Uh, these are, these again require huge instruments and these are sort of industry standard to achieve good quality etching with high quality line finish etcetera, etcetera. So, the next uh, uh, of course, at this point I think I will stop here in this particular class and I will continue my discussion on this. Uh, we have been uh, discussing uh, the, the approach based on etching. But there is another approach uh, that is lift up that is not exactly for the chip fabrication, but particularly if you would like to make metallic nanostructures one always uses this lift off. And I mentioned this when I was talking about this undercut, undercut thing uh, optimization of exposure and baking. So, that is another quick methodology that I will discuss and then I will give you some very novel uh, sort of research level almost fun, uh, fun type uh, developments that has uh, taken place in photolithography. And in next class, we will wrap our discussion on photolithography. Thank you.